The general expectation is that three wide receivers will get drafted in the top 10 of the 2024 NFL draft. We're going to break down those prospects today on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. You are locked on NFL scouting with the Draft Dude, your daily podcast for NFL and college football scouting. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's better than this? It's God. Guys, being dudes here on the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast. We're the Draft Dudes. I'm Joe Marino from Locked On Bills. He's Kyle Krabs from Locked On Dolphins. And we are your NFL experts here with you daily to talk team building across the league. I'm a Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast with the Draft Dudes, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Want to issue a big thank you, shout out, and welcome to our everydayers. Those of you who make Locked On NFL Scouting your first listen every single day, we appreciate y'all being here very, very much. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Joe, happy Tuesday to you. Happy dudes dive into draft, deep dive into draft day to you here on Locked On NFL Scouting. Um, I think it's also National Laugh Day. Yeah, it's oh. National yeah, National uh, Let's Laugh Day on March nineteenth. So okay. Don't be afraid to to let a few jokes. Let, let one rip. Yeah. Okay. Got something. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's. I guess I right. I don't have any fun, quirky bits here for the top. Do you just want to dive in with uh, Chris <laughs> Sims's wide receiver three in this year's class? Oh gosh, there it is. There's you did the thing. <laughs> there's, there's the there's the joke. Yeah. Well, how did he have it? Was it um, what was the neighbors one? I think it was neighbors and Brian Thomas were one. Brian Thomas was was yeah in that top tier number number two receiver, and based on Harrison, film. Of and then uh, I don't, don't remember who was four, but Roma Dunze didn't make the five, and Roma Dunze noticed and took took exception to it. Oh, it was on social media. Okay, That's, all right. I think Roman Wilson was five. Yeah, was too I, low. Was too low. Love so the we, love for Roman honest, Wilson. We left, we left my wide receiver one off in in Roma Wilson. <laughs> All right, so we're well, going to talk. Serious. We're going to talk about not a serious thing. We are going to talk about these three wide receivers today, and what we want to do is talk about the appeal and, and why a team should pick these players early, and then maybe what the concerns are, maybe why um, a certain player might not be as good of a fit for certain offenses. So that's what we're going to do, and we'll start with who I think is the best player in the class, Marvin Harrison Jr., the wide receiver from Ohio State. I think this is such a simple evaluation. I think this is one of the easiest evaluations I've ever done. Why should your team be interested in Marvin Harrison? It's because he's an absolutely dynamic, can-do-anything wide receiver that has size, athleticism, route running, ball skills. He's a dude, man. He's a certified dude at the position that I think can very, very quickly be a legit number one go-to guy for an NFL passing game. I would be inclined to agree. Uh, and I, I think the number one, why should you draft Marvin Harrison Jr. is that he can fit within the confines of any style of offensive play that you want to run in the NFL. The like, probably as close to a universal prospect as we have in this year's class, whether you want to run a timing-based offense, if you want to run a vertical-based offense, if you want to attack the middle of the field, if you want to live and die by throws outside the numbers, like he can do all of it. And the fact that there is that transcendentness about how and where he wins with the size profile mixed with the athleticism profile and being a volume receiver and, and having that in his resume, um, all of those things for me puts together, like you said, a very cut and dry evaluation uh, for, for Marvin Harrison Jr. On the other side of it, like if you're looking for concerns, I think you'd have to really nitpick to identify disqualifiers for Marvin Harrison Jr. Cause I don't think there's any, if there's an area of his game that I don't think is as advanced as other components i would say forcing missed tackles in terms of when he becomes a runner yards after catch i think he's 
a fine player yards after catch. I don't necessarily think about Marvin Harrison as dangerous with the ball in his hands. And you're not drafting Marvin Harrison because you're looking for yak production in a gadget role or anything like that. He'll be fine within the context of a play to turn, run, be competitive, be physical, get the yards that are available. But he's is he a hold your breath guy? No, he's uh, to me he's not yeah. that with the ball in his hands. So well, I think that's where the conversation gets interesting with the other guys because I think if you're looking for a creator with the ball in his hands, you might want to draft somebody. You might want to target or prioritize somebody. Who we're going to talk about next in lieu of Marvin Harrison Jr. Right, where like if your priority is ball in hands, how do you create? explosive speed, explosive acceleration. Marvin Harrison has those things, but it's not like the calling card on who he is. Right. So if you want to get more specialized with your skill set, I suppose that would be the argument to, especially when you, you open up the economic can of worms of where can I get player X versus yeah. a top five pick from Marvin Harrison Jr. Right. I think that's where the conversation gets interesting and realistically, there, there's only going to be probably two or three teams that have the conversation about, should we draft Marvin Harrison Jr. before Marvin yeah. Harrison Jr. is drafted? In my opinion, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a, a take regarding landing spots for Marvin Harrison. Let's live in a world where the Patriots pick a quarterback at three or they, they trade out and some team comes and picks a quarterback at three. So we have quarterbacks one, two, three. I don't think Arizona can trade away from Marvin Harrison Jr. at number four. I don't think they can. I don't think they should. What do you think the cost would be that you would say, okay, yeah, that I, I don't blame you. Is three ones enough in this wide receiver class, depending on how far back you go? So your your most attractive situations would be Minnesota offering you 11 and 11, 23. 23. So I'm going to get one. I'm going to get a lesser. Re, I, your receiver need is massive, mm -hmm. so you're gonna you're gonna get a lesser receiver at eleven, and then some other player. Is it outside the realm of possibility that Odunze would be there at eleven, with Chicago's move for Keenan Allen and the Jets potentially making a splash in free agency? It's not outside. It's not outside of that. But I I have Marvin Harrison comfortably graded higher. Than Roma Dunze. So class of his own is where class to, you, very much class. I have a top 10 grade on Marvin Harrison. I don't have a top 10 grade on the other two receivers. They're close, but I don't have a top 10 grade on them. It's a different probably, probably be a good time to clarify what top 10 grade means because people who haven't followed us for years oh, might gosh. not know the because some people just their jaws just hit the floor. If they're new yeah. to listening to the show, they have no idea what you're talking about. A top 10 grade is a special, special, special prospect. Um, you're talking Nick Bosa caliber. You're talking Joe Burrow caliber. You're talking Marvin Harrison Jr. caliber prospect where no matter what collection of players existed in any given draft, they're worth a top 10 pick. And I understand that in every draft, there's 10 players picked in the top 10, but never have I come close to having 10 top 10 grades. I might have three yeah. or four, maybe five. Um, and so it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a very special territory of prospect. It doesn't mean I don't like neighbors. It doesn't mean I don't like a Dunze. I do. I, they're awesome. But Harrison's just another level in terms of how I see it. So top, top 10 grading, at least for us. And we've been doing this together since 15, 2015, almost 10 years, many years. Um, and we've changed what the evaluation process has looked like over time because we've, and, and obviously we're we're both in our own unique lenses right now, but I think the ideology that we apply is still the same that we'd applied over recent years. Top 10 grade. It's like, do you feel like you're getting appropriate value with a pick in a certain range? Yeah. So if I pick three and I've got four guys that I have like the highest caliber of grade or bucket that I could put a player in, which would be what Joe's referring to as a top 10, I feel really good. I'm going to get appropriate value for where my pick is slot. If I pick nine and I've got seven top 10 grades with air quotes, I might say, okay, I'm on the clock. I have a top 10 pick, but I don't necessarily have a player that meets 
parallel perfect world value for where this pick is, that's where you get into conversation of, is anybody calling us because their scheme is different? So they might still have a player that's out there who they regard as a top 10 pick where they would want to come up and I can come down a little bit and then make a pick again in five spots where I'm outside the top 10 and I feel better about getting appropriate value for my pick. So it's just kind of, we try not to live in the vertical, this is my big board and my 12th ranked player. Like <laughs> it's such a unnuanced way, but it obviously it's, it's external media. That's been the standard way to present this information. And we try to do it a little bit differently to reflect where individual teams are at with their own processes. So with that out of the way, we're going to next focus in on LSU wide receiver Malik Stud. neighbors. So be sure Stud. to stick with us. You shouldn't have to worry when you're looking to buy tickets for your next big event. Well, you don't have to because game time is here and it's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They've got killer deals on last minute tickets, all in prices. They give you a view from your seat and a best price guarantee. I mean, simply put, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. The app is awesome, easy to navigate. They give you flash deals. And I also love this. If you buy a ticket from game time, they send it straight to your phone. You don't have to dig through emails to find it so snag the tickets without the stress and download the game time app create an account and use code locked on for twenty dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code locked on that's l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n for twenty dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed we're back and we're talking about lsu wide receiver malik neighbors next on the show the objective, Joe, the first thing we need to outline is why would a team want Malik Neighbors? What would Malik Neighbors bring to your team if you were looking to add him? Explosive playmaking ability. He is a guy that can catch and turn and run and rip off an explosive chunk. He's a guy that can win vertically down the field and make plays on deep throws, he is absolutely a big play wide receiver that is I mean, he, he's 20 years old. He's going to turn 21 in July. So he's young, two dynamic seasons back-to-back -back at LSU this past year, leading the FBS and receiving it over 1,500 yards and 14 touchdowns. This guy can make big plays. There's some rawness. We'll get to that. But the guy can create big plays. And we know like defenses are literally structuring themselves right now to eliminate and reduce explosive plays against them because the probability of scoring points is way higher for an offense on a drive where they get an explosive play. By comparison, defenses say, we want you to string together 9, 10, 11 plays if you're going to score on us. And we think that in that quest to do so, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to get a negative play. You're going to get a penalty. You're going to get a turnover. And we're going to have a chance to stop you. They don't want explosive plays. Well, guess what Malik Neighbors does? He does the thing defenses don't want to happen. He creates explosive plays. And it's it's how he does it for me. Because it's not a – this is not purely a uh, – what's the, the Randy Moss song, take the top off the defense, straight cash, homie, right? Like, it's not just run down the field and win vertically down the field. He can take hitches. He can take yeah. crossers. He can take screens on the perimeter. And he can create the explosives with the ball in his hands. And that's the big difference. And that's when everybody wants to play quarters and Tampa 2. And they want to play all these safeties at 18 yards of depth and say, just stay deeper than the deepest, guys. That's your only job. Don't worry about run support. Just get back there. Don't, don't let them run by you. The voids that that creates, the spacing that that creates, the stress that that creates on the underneath players. When you have a guy who is as zero to 100 as yeah, explosive man. as Malik Neighbors is, when you have a guy who is as shifty in tight quarters as Malik Neighbors is, who has the field vision that Malik Neighbors has, that is, and this, this there's a lot of raving about things that aren't get open and catch the football. And I get that with Malik Neighbors, but it's not like he's deficient in those areas. And I, I think he comes in with a, sufficient threshold of doing those things and so much room to continue to grow that in turn is going to make him 
a really, really dynamic player as he continues to add more polish to his game. I think as we polish is a good word, right? Because we're next going to consider like what are the concerns with the player, um, and and why should there be any level of reservation? And I think it's because he does need polish. He's a guy that I wouldn't label a route technician. I think one of the things that applies even to Brian Thomas, who's a, another potential first round receiver from LSU, is very limited route trees that they ran at LSU. Now they were able to win with athleticism and, and create a lot of space and get open. But the, the route technician part of it is an area where they both need to grow, particularly neighbors. I think his release package and kind of getting rid of, rid of some wasted steps and finding a little bit more urgency off the line to maximize that vertical speed uh, is is something that he needs to, to get better at. So I think just the technical parts of winning in the NFL as a route runner compared to LSU I think that's going to be where the growth is going to be needed for, for Malik neighbors to, to and, be the, the explosive playmaker that we saw in college yeah. show up in the NFL. So I, I think that's a good kind of talking point to lead into uh, why he might not be for you. I think if you're going to draft Malik neighbors with the intent of him immediately being the showcase of your passing offense, I think that will create more roadblocks to his development as a player than if he were to go somewhere that has a featured receiver early on where it's not like, okay, we add the extra attention to neighbors and now he's trying to get more polished as a player while dealing with more attention and more volume of coverage rolled in his direction. So having a runway for him where he has more incidences of being in a one-on-one situation or having more space to work with because he's not the primary key for the defense to eliminate on any given play, I think is important for Malik neighbors to maximize what he's going to look like in his early stage. And then in turn, help prevent some uh, poor muscle memory or, or poor experiences that he then has to fight for more adversity as he continues to stack on who he is as a player. Do you have any thoughts on his overall approach to the draft process where he didn't, he didn't measure at the NFL scouting combine, mm -hmm. LSU lists him at six foot, 200 pounds. I never really questioned his size. I thought he had good size. He looks body composition looks That's good fine. to me. Zero questions about the athleticism on tape. But like, I also felt like there was a good story to tell there for him, right? Like, wow, look at, I am big and I am explosive. And he chose not to, to reveal that to teams. I guess everybody kind of knows, but I didn't think he had anything to hide. Yeah. Uh, I didn't come into this process expecting like that big question from a league that's yeah. like, okay, he's, he's got to clear this threshold or it might hurt him in the eyes of teams. Um, is he probably a little smaller than he's listed at on the roster? Probably. Right. Um, I don't know. I think he, he ran confirmed four fours in high school. I bet he runs faster than that. Now yeah, I bet I, his GPS times are a lot faster than that. Now, Yeah. if I was a betting man, I'd bet this guy's in next gen stats, top 20 GPS time at some point in the next three years. <laughs> For some right. explosive play, getting out in the open field, right? Yeah. Like uh, he can absolutely fly, and he gets up to top end speed so fast. So a little surprised, maybe. Um, but I think the there's kind of a revolution going on with upper echelon prospects in the draft process in general that the, the players have every right to kind of put their foot down and say, "This is what you're going to get," and I'm not going to jump through hoops and put my playing career in jeopardy to to learn to do things that aren't playing related. Um, but that also doesn't get into weighing in at the combine. So oh, it's 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 a unique intersection of you know, kind of players looking out for for what's best for them and being empowered to do so versus the norms of what the pre-draft process has traditionally been about. I think the other thing that people are talking about with Malik neighbors is that there are people out there that have him as wide receiver one over mm -hmm. Harrison. And there's some insiders that are saying there are teams that agree. Now I, I don't sit there. Like if you disagree with me on a prospect or where a guy's ranked, like that's fine. Like that's if everyone just agreed on everything, that's boring. I'd be I'd be curious what process led to that conclusion. Like what what are you pointing to with neighbors 
that says, yeah, that's my top receiver on the board that it, it, it trumps him over, over Harrison. What do you, what do you think they're pointing to? Probably the, I don't know, the acceleration with the ball in his hands. Like, because it's not like Marvin Harrison Jr. is not out here hitting 22 miles per hour on the gun at six foot three, 215 pounds or whatever he is. Like he's doing 23, that. 23 miles. 23, right, excuse yeah. me. I told yeah. him short. That's a lot more. Oh, another mile in an hour. That's a lot of, that's a yeah, lot. It yeah. Would, in a shorter period of time, that's still a lot yeah. of distance, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it the Hamilton st- or the the Hamilton stuff. The the Harrison stuff feels like Kyle Hamilton fatigue a little bit to me. Where that was, there's there's you've exhausted all the talking points. You want to you continue to put these guys under the microscope. We've known exactly what Marvin Harrison Jr. is for two years now, and that's not to say within a certain role on a certain offense. Malik neighbors can't be as productive as Marvin Harrison Jr. But I don't know if you're looking at it strictly through the lens of risk assessments, which is what we're doing on the outside looking in. I don't know how you look at the two players and say the guy who's more complete is a higher risk. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. To me. I struggle. I struggle with it as well. All right. Rome, a Dunze, Washington receiver coming up here. We're going to break him down. So be sure to stick with us. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, that you could still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. Roma Dunze. Roma Dunze. University of Washington, wide receiver. Has some big fans out there. Uh, did, was it DJ had him like five? It was like on his board. more recent player rankings. Oh, I didn't see his latest board. Um, I do see his latest mock draft. He has him going ahead of neighbors. No, nope. After neighbors. I think there's a Dunze playing in Washington's offense. Um, I think he was more of an engine for the success and look, they had a bunch of good wide receivers and they had a good quarterback. But if you ask me who I think the best player is out of all that, who predictably is going to have the most successful pro career, I think a Dunze was the straw that stirred the drink for that Washington offense. And I think that's the biggest feather in his cap um, in spite of them being a high volume passing offense that pushed the ball down the field. He wanted enough different ways that I felt really, really good about him coming in and being a multifaceted. I think he's more diverse than neighbors is now as a receiver. I think he's probably the, if you miss out on Harrison, a Dunze can do a lot of the same things at six foot three, 210 pounds runs well, but not like Harrison. Well has good body mm-hmm. control, but not like Harrison body control. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, He's a he's a technician, man. Uh, there, he's a very technical player, and, and I can appreciate that about that. I like how he runs routes. I like how he sets up his breaks. I like his hands. I like his body control. I like how competitive and physical he is with the ball in his hands post catch. Six three two twelve thirty two and a quarter inch ar- arms nine nine two RAS score. This guy checks a lot, a lot of boxes, and I think where maybe. He doesn't have as much flash 
as Harrison in Neighbors is because he is such like I think he he does he makes difficult things look easy. Like the game looks easy to me when I watch a Dunze. I think just the way he plays it in like I even watched him and thought, is he is he super athletic? Like I don't know, just because it's very smooth and natural. Um he is very athletic. That's that's not a concern, but I, I don't think that he pops explosively to the degree that you see of a Malik neighbors on film. And the player that I I compare him to in, in a number of ways is Keenan Allen, because Keenan Allen is a guy that is like not super flashy, but my goodness, is he a baller? Just does the right things, reliable on the field. And I think a Dunze or Dunes or Dunze does that as well, where there's just not as much like flair with it. But my goodness, does he make the game look easy and natural? And I think that's a very high compliment for a for a prospect. Yeah. Um, and then you look at the athletic profile as well, extremely well-rounded in, so you've got a technical player who has size and instincts, runs diverse routes, six foot three, 212 pounds of the combine ran, uh, 69th percentile in the 40 yard dash 4.45. Uh, his 10 yard split time was uh, 76th percentile and 1.52. He jumped 39 inches, which was 85th percentile. He had a 20-yard shuttle of 4.03 seconds, which is an outstanding time. That's 91st percentile for wide receivers. Like, So it's just a very complete resume. So I, I guess the divider is just that extra gear that we think Harrison has, right? Because I think that's the conversation is – it's another player that's built that same way, who's technical in the same ways. What's the drop off, and and why is it the separation with Harrison so clear to you? I think there's another level of dynamic that exists with Harrison, and I think I think even some of the ball skills down the field are are just better, and that's because he set such a high bar. Like I don't want to like diminish anything that Adunze is or isn't because he's awesome. I just think that Harrison's at a special, special level with everything. And maybe there's only one special as it relates to Dunze. There's two <laughs> with Harrison. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I, I gotta be careful there. Right. Like, cause I don't want to diminish him. I think he's really, really good, but I think Harrison's just on another level. And that's exactly where I stand with it too. So if you are a team, I guess that's where you putting it back in Arizona's court. It is interesting is the extra level of Marvin Harrison Jr. enough for you to turn down two additional first round picks? I just, I, I would have a level of concern about him getting to 11. Cause I think, could you imagine him with Aaron Rodgers, who, by the way, Daniel Jeremiah just dropped the mock draft. They have, they have them moving up to five for a receiver, the jets. So then let's do what the Eagles did where the Eagles traded down from six to 12 and then back up to 10 for Devonta Smith. Remember how that went? Yeah. They had six. Miami goes from three to 12 with San Francisco and comes back up to six to put them in position to draft Jalen Waddle. Philly goes from six back to 12. And then I think sends a three to go up and get the receiver. I think the biggest problem is Tennessee, Tennessee at seven in a timing West coast offense. Adunze is a dream, an absolute dream for because that. He has, he, he has, the speed element, but he also has the the size yeah. and physicality, which they have traditionally. Yeah. And obviously Rand Carthon's in his second year as a GM there. So it's still, we're still learning that, but uh, Brian Callahan came from T Higgins and Jamar chase. So. Yeah. And I, look, I know they have Hopkins and Ridley. That's, that's nice. Bur Burks is a young player, but I mean, Hopkins is probably one more year, right? Mm -hmm. Receivers are really expensive, right? So uh, well, there's value all the way around with that idea. I, I, I think, just to put like a big picture draft conversation on these three guys. Um, I thought Arizona did a really nice job reading the room last year with how they handled the early draft with Paris Johnson and, and their trade situation with Houston. Right. Yeah. So I'll be interested to see how well Monty can read the room this time. around. The only miscalculation that Monty had was that Houston was going to be so good. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
They didn't count on that being the 27th pick in the next right. year's draft. Yeah, right. I don't think anybody did. So the only only uh only miscalculation he had there. So that'll that'll be an interesting subplot amongst these three receivers. But that is gonna do it for us here on Locked on NFL Scouting. I'm Kyle Krabs. He's John Marino. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the top of the wide receiver class. Come on back and see us again tomorrow. We will be back. We hope to see you then.